let's talk about Naomi, 60-year-old woman, post-menopause. And, and we can, I think, bring in perimenopause into this conversation as well. I appreciate there's probably um, listeners who are interested in, in that phase as well. But Naomi is uh, 60 years old and she has low bone mineral density. Okay. Now, she's not taking HRT, and the reason for that is she has a history of breast cancer and was told okay. it's contraindicated. Now, yep. she's gained a little bit of weight around the midsection despite doing regular exercise and um, is eating sort of quote-unquote clean most of the time. Um, not a big drinker. Um, again, I've based this off comments and, and messages that I've received. Um, she has two or three glasses of wine a week. Um, she's unable to run that hurts her knees a bit but she can cycle walk and lifts weights and her main goal is to improve her bone mineral density she mm -hmm. was told that would be a good idea and her mother has had several fractures um, and she would also really like to lose some belly fat and of course stay cancer free um, which she's yep. now been for three years so cool. that's the profile that we're considering here you just mentioned then it gets really really hard to sort of lose weight, build strength as someone goes starts going through perimenopause and then into postmenopause. Why is that? During perimenopause, because there is a shift in the estrogen progesterone ratios, um, there tends to be less and less progesterone that is being produced because there's more and more in ovulatory cycles. So we have a down regulation of not only our progesterone receptors, but also some of our estradiol receptors because progesterone is not countering estradiol. So there's not as much of a stimulation. The other thing is there's a massive shift in gut microbiome. So when we're looking at natural hormones and how they are activated, we have first the hepatic response where the hormones go to the liver, get bound by your sex hormone binding globulin, get excreted in the bile into the intestines and the gut bugs there unbind it and shoot it back out into the system where then your sex hormones work. When you stop having as much estrogen and progesterone, then you don't have as much coming into the gut. So then you don't have as many of those gut bugs that are going to increase the diversity. We see an increase in the amount of firmicutes, which is the gut bugs that are responsible for obesity and visceral fat gain, and a decrease in the bacteriotes that's responsible for lean mass and, and um, I guess general health, they say. So when we're looking at body composition shift, we see that it is a affect of less response of these um, estrogen progesterone receptors, as well as a change in the gut microbiome. Um, we see one of the first telling signs is women will lose power and strength. And they're like, what's going on? I still have lean mass, what's going on? Because estrogen, not only is it responsible for stimulating your satellite cell for lean mass development, but it is tightly tied to myosin. So myosin and actin, you know, myosin is a strong bond it's for a muscle contraction. If you don't have estrogen or you have different doses of estrogen, that myosin is going to have a strong bond with actin. So we start to lose, you know, strength and power. The other is it is directly affected or directly affects how much acetylcholine is being stored in the vesicles in the gap junction. So you have less estrogen, you have less acetylcholine. So then you have less of a neuromuscular response for actually stimulating those muscle fibers for a contraction. So this is another reason why women start to lose lean mass. And when we look at the general recommendations of 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, two of them resistance training, that's like the opposite of what women in perimenopause and postmenopause should be doing. Mm -hmm. So Hear me with, out, I saw your face. Yeah, with, with, <laughs> with and I want to go into to exactly what you would recommend for women during these phases. But based on what you just said then about estrogen, and so in, I appreciate um, in this kind of avatar, I mentioned that Naomi is not taking HRT. Yep. But would you say that HRT makes it um, easier to maintain strength and lose weight? No. So when we look at what people are using for menopause hormone therapy, you can have microdized doses, which then sort of has a hepatic response, but it's only 25% bioavailable as compared to what your body's naturally producing. So what I want people to understand about hormone replacement, it's not really hormone replacement, it's menopause hormone therapy. It is a therapy. 
And we know there's really fantastic efficacy for people who are having significant issues and symptoms that interfere with daily life. So we see mood swings, hot flashes, night sweats, poor sleep, um, vaginal dryness, all of those things. And when it comes down to body composition, it doesn't have a true effect. We see it slows down the rate of change, but doesn't stop the change. We see that it can be used as a therapy to slow down the rate of bone mineral loss, but it is not a treatment mm -hmm. for osteoporosis. So there's this misconception really circulating about hormone therapy and the immediate response is every woman in perimenopause should go on it. But in reality, it is an individual thing and we have to look at at the fact that those people who are shouting that from the rooftops are not looking at nutrition and exercise. So when I said earlier, we look at an external stress to apply to the body that's gonna create an adaptation. So when we look at Naomi and she can't use hormone therapy, that's sweet, she doesn't have to. Cause we can look at power training, right? And again, it's relative. What is heavy lifting to a 60 year old? If she's never lifted 15 kilo barbell, that's probably heavy to her, right? So we look at implementing that power-based stuff. And there's been some really fantastic studies that have looked at 70 and 80 year old women who ditch the hypertrophy 10 to 12 rep range and actually get into the 70 to 80% one rep max and doing the six to eight. Not only do they increase their lean mass, they improve their bone density and proprioception. So their falls risk decreases. So this is what we're looking at when we're looking at women who are postmenopause. So it's not just about body composition. It's like, okay, if this is what's happening when you're 60, we also want to look forward to 70, 80, 90. How are we going to keep your quality of life? Resistance training is the critical factor here. Not only do we see it as the stimulus for central nervous system to kick in, without the use of estrogen. So if we're lifting heavy loads, then the central nervous system is going, oh gosh, we got to have more acetylcholine. We have to have strong bond. We got to do something here because you know, what used to work isn't working for us. So we have a really strong response in that power training. We develop the lean mass, we get the power, we get the strength. Mm -hmm. We also have feed forward to brain health. So I don't know um, if you've talked to Louisa Nicola at all, I haven't and yet. She's done I know her. I'm, yeah. I'm actually connecting with her in Sydney in, I think, six weeks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's fun. Um, but she's pointed a lot of really cool research out to me about the benefits of resistance training and the neural growth factor in the brain. So we know aerobic training is good for volume of the brain, but the neural growth factor is good at attenuating Alzheimer's risk. So if we look at what's happening with brain changes at the onset of menopause, we see a lot of brain changes and can be attenuated with resistance training. So if we look at Naomi, I'm going to be like, okay, you know what? We're not going to look at that 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, because if you get into that moderate intensity, it's going to increase your sympathetic drive. It's going to increase your baseline cortisol, and it's not going to do anything with regards to recomping your body. You're not going to increase your lean mass. You're not going to decrease the serial fat. You're not going to improve your bone density. We have to look at resistance training being the cornerstone of everything you do with some true sprint interval training. Interesting. So just so that people are across what you're saying there, when you're talking about m sort of moderate intensity continuous training, we're talking about a slow steady state jog or sitting on a stationary bike and kind of heart rate at 100, uh, 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 sorry, about 60%, 65% of max heart rate. Um, yeah. And while that's where I guess general population recommendations may be to get that 150 minutes in of that moderate intensity you're saying we can do better and for absolutely for for a woman who is in both perimenopause and postmenopause we should rethink mm -hmm. what that looks like focus more on resistance training and high intensity so let's go through that um, i think it might sound uh for lack of a better word, counterintuitive for a postmenopausal woman to select a weight where they're only doing six reps. I think a lot of the time what I see is very small weights and doing very high rep, you know, 20, 30s, and I think that's considered safer or... Um, yeah, that's a con. You know, it's that social confound because no one wants to see their grandma in the gym lifting heavy weights and doing deadlifts, right? Because mm -hmm. it's just not in the mental scope. 
But from a physiological perspective, when they're doing that high rep, the 20, 30, it's a metabolic stress that puts them in that moderate intensity. It's not going to stimulate lean mass gain. It's going to stimulate that visceral fat. You might get a little bit of muscle tone, but it's not strength. Because that, again, is all about breaking down things, and we don't want to do that. And I'm not telling people who are peri- and postmenopause to immediately go in the gym and do a 100-kilo deadlift. We phase people in. We get them comfortable. We want them to move well first. We want to find their anomalies. If you have osteoporosis, you know, we look at having support. So we might use a Smith's machine instead of a, just a, a plain rack, right? So we're looking at what are the anomalies? What are the movement limitations? And then we have to apply load once we learn your mechanics to move well. Um, and then when we talk about like bone mineral density, Resistance training significantly helps with that, right? We see the load. We see the multidirectional stress from resistance training improves bone mineral density. Walking doesn't do it. It's not a multidirectional stress. Running doesn't do it. It's not a multidirectional stress. The two biggest things for helping with bone density is resistance training and jump training. So maybe you're um, you know, jump roping as a warm up. So you're getting that multi multidirectional stress through the bone that is going to stimulate bone growth and density. So running, not, not it. And so when you tell people, okay, let go on a moderate intensity walk, I'm like, no, if you're a guy that helps with cardiovascular health, but for a woman, it doesn't, it's not a high enough dose to instigate better vascular compliance, nor is it a strong enough stress to recomp the body, nor is it a strong enough stress to create any kind of lean mass and strength development. So Naomi wants to recomp. She wants to try and shift a little bit of that belly fat. How much time does she need to dedicate to an exercise regime and what would it look like? You mentioned resistance training and HIIT being the priorities, but what would that or what may that look like over a kind of seven day period? Um, she can do something every day. Um, you know, let's say she has 45 minutes to an hour a day. Oh, she has a lot of mm. a lot of extra time because she doesn't need that much to work out. Okay, cool. And I say that because when we take away the menstrual cycle and we look basically back at sex differences, women's bodies again are very endurant. We don't need volume when we get into that postmenopause stage. So the body is very, very, very good at going long and slow and putting on fat. So we need something that is polarized from that. So resistance training, we say three when you feel more comfortable, preferably four resistance training sessions a week um, and then two to three true high intensity sessions so one of the like if i base it out it's like one of my favorite workouts to get people to understand what i mean by lifting and true high resistance training is a buy-in where we look at a buy-in of 10 deadlifts at 75 percent and then immediately getting on an erg either a cycling erg or a rowing erg and sprinting as hard as you can for the remainder of a minute. Then you have one full minute off, then you do it again. And you do six rounds of that done and dusted, 12 minutes total. So it's every every minute, every other minute on the minute for the most part. And people are like, that's enough. I'm like, yes, if you're doing it right, that is enough. You're getting the loading from the deadlifts and you're getting the high intensity, true sprint interval training because you're trying to accumulate more meters or more distance every time you get on that erg. So you have six tries to get faster and faster. So it's that motivation to go full gas, knowing that you have a full minute of recovery. And people are like, what? No, I can't do that when I'm 60. I'm like, yes, you can. You've been mentally prepared that you can't through all the nuances of society telling you that when you hit menopause, you're frail and you're doomed to be fat and and just kind of a burden to society. But that's not true. It's not true at all. You're fully capable of doing this kind of work, but it's relative. Like that deadlift might be the bar. It might be two five kilo de or barbells at the start, but it's the movement and that intensity that we're after. Right. I asked you this question earlier when we were talking about Alex, but in this kind of context here, when it comes to shifting the belly fat, how important is this training piece versus the nutrition piece? Uh, training is really important because we need that stimulus. We need that external loading. We need that stimulus to support the body because we don't have estrogen and progesterone. 
nutrition does play a role as well because we know we can't out exercise a bad diet. So then when we look at nutrition, protein super, super important in peri and postmenopause, probably more so than premenopausal because we have uh, anabolic resistance as we get older. So it takes more protein to get that effect. So we look post-exercise protein for women who are peri and postmenopause is at 40 gram dose as opposed to what we generally hear of a 25, 30 gram dose because we need more for that tipping point. Um, and regular protein across the day is so important. And we find that it's really difficult for older people to eat that much protein because, they're, you know, I'm not hungry, but we really push that protein and good carbohydrate from fruit and veg for that gut diversity. So we match those two together and we start to see significant change. And is fasting still a, a no-no? Do you still like the sort of 15 gram protein prior yep. to a training session in the morning? Yep. Yep. Especially early postmenopausal women, because they already have a higher baseline level of cortisol. So they're already in that sympathetic drive. They already have the predisposition for putting on the cereal fat. So we need that protein. We need the hypothalamus to be like, oh, okay, yep, yeah, there's some stuff coming in. I'm good. I don't have to have the signals to put in that extra abdominal fat. Mm -hmm. And is there or are there any? supplements or particular nutrients or uh, herbs or adaptogens that would be different to what we spoke about earlier that may be more relevant during this period of life? Uh, so I, I'm going to say creatine again, especially now when we're looking at brain changes and brain health. Um, and yep, three to five grams daily. And then depending on how stressed she is, right? Uh, I really try to get people to use ashwagandha when they're in this early postmenopause phase, just to really try to get them out of that sympathetic drive that's new um, and really relearn that parasympathetic. I can also pull a lot on Huberman's non-sleep deep rest, which I think is yoga nidra for the first part, and implement that as well. Anything that gets that parasympathetic drive is going to help with body recomp as well as getting that really significant sympathetic response downgraded. Mm -hmm. Regarding that body recomp, does Naomi need to be in a calorie deficit to shift the belly weight or with the right training and nutrition, can the body composition just change without being in a kind of calorie deficit per se? Yeah, so... Unfortunately, the automatic response when people start to hit peri and postmenopause and they're putting on the weight is calories in, calories out. I need to be in a calorie deficit. But then this leads people to being in low energy availability and, and red S. Yes, the metabolism does slow down a little bit when you hit postmenopause, but we can counter that with protein intake. So it's not about calorie deficit as it is about macronutrient redistribution. So we're looking at that higher amount of protein, a little bit lower amount of carbohydrate and good amount of fat. So instead of hitting uh, about 40% of calories coming from carbohydrate, we're dropping it down to about 35. And we're having protein really up there hitting that two grams per kilogram of body weight um, because we want a lot of fruit and veg for that gut diversity is super important because we've had that shift in perimenopause, but we need that protein. Mm -hmm. We need that protein for lots of body functions as well as lean mass. Mm -hmm.